Um, I'm going to share work for about 20 minutes. Um, it's going to be uh, a, a wide range of work. I tried to pick a few um, poems that I don't read that often. I've been doing a number of events, as uh, Kathleen well knows, um, and as she's experienced with. Um, and so I'm going to try to read some poems that I haven't read. And I'm also probably going to read some poems I haven't read in a few weeks. I've been doing a lot of library events and elementary and middle school events. So I've been um, kind of G-rated. Uh, G so I'm going to go outside of that <laughs> bubble a little bit. Um, but to begin, a, a few poems um, uh, by others. This one is by Dorian Locks. Enough music. Sometimes when we're on a long drive and we've talked enough and listened to enough music and stopped twice once to eat, once to see the view, we fall into this rhythm of silence. It swings back and forth between us like a rope over a lake. Maybe it's what we don't say that saves us. Lots of time in the car. I used to <laughs> lots of time, and, and I talk to myself a lot in the car, so. The Poison Tree, William Blake. I was angry with my friend I told my wrath, my wrath did end. I was angry with my foe, I told it not, my wrath did grow. And I watered it in fears night and morning with my tears, and I stunned it with smiles and with soft, deceitful wiles. And it grew both day and night till it bore an apple bright, and my foe beheld it shine, and he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole when the night had veiled the pole. In the morning, glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree, the poison tree. And then lastly, um, I thought this poem was going to be incredibly appropriate tonight, um, but it's only kind of appropriate. This is by a poet named Tom Wobker, who just passed away this spring. Um, he was called the Bard of Sherman Avenue uh, over in Coeur d'Alene, and he wrote about 800 poems um, for the newspaper column. Uh, that appeared every Sunday in the Spokesman Review. Uh, they're very short, um, witty poems, um, and uh, this will give you a taste of them. Shipwreck. The crew is in a dreadful mess. When will they send an SOS? For it is clear as it can be, the mariners are lost at sea. <laughs> okay. So I'm all about radical transitions and radical juxtapositions, and um, yeah, I, I think that uh, my second book was called The Tangled Line because in some ways that is probably the best articulation of my poetics. I have lots and lots of different poetries that I'm excited about. Um, Ed, Ed Hirsch, in an interview with uh, him, um, told me um, we need all of our poetries. And I think that that's kind of uh, my approach, um, and I think it speaks to um, all the different f modes of writing that I pursue, but also all the different writing that, that excites me. So um, I thought I might share a couple new poems, a couple poems that I don't read that often, and then maybe a few, few old ones in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. This is a newer, a newer poem um, called Scars. Some trailers lost their skirting in the last storm, bearing an underworld of cinder blocks and flat tires old hoses in leaky coils, busted bikes, millipedes and spiders gathering beneath the creaking of feet and beds, the occasional crash of a thrown beer bottle, shattered mirrors, or worse. My father nearly killed my mother in the kitchen for mica countertop broken at the corner where he brought down her head. Sometimes in sunlight the scar shines, skin smooth and tight, Sometimes beneath moon and stars, sometimes a single dim bulb on the porch is enough. One humid night, she opened the screen door to the neighbor's daughter, who staggered in wearing tattered cut-off jeans and a black bra with one torn strap. My mother iced the girl's eye, and the glow through the window held them safe for a few sobbing minutes. Sometimes I was told to go find something to do, and I actually played with the slow kid down the street. Even at eight, I sensed that he smiled too much, and we chased each other around their single wide, laughing and yelling until his mother came out and sharply said it was time for lunch, time for the boy up the street to go home. As if she knew that two years later, I'd shout retard at her son as I cut through their yard to spend the night at Greg's 15, 
who, after his parents were asleep, held me down and whispered that I was going to feel what it was like to be a girl. I don't know the name of the kid who twirled in circles and fell to the ground giggling, who chased grasshoppers caught in the wind, always smiling. But I still know the heat from the flames after his place sparked a cigarette his sleeping mother dropped between oily cushions. She ran outside and the door locked behind her. I also know that my father sprinted down the street and burnt his hands on each of the doorknobs, hurled a cinder block through the bedroom window, and was held back by arriving firemen who saw that the aluminum siding was starting to melt. I know that the woman's screams were loud as the shriek of tornado sirens, a cue that actually brought everyone away from TVs to huddle together in a cement shelter at the center of the cul-de-sacs near the communal swimming pool that was always closed or stinging with too much chlorine, some old couples dragging coolers and lawn chairs down the steep stairs, most of us leaning, slouching, standing around, impatient and ashamed, waiting for the storm to blow over, the wind to stop, waiting for someone to say, all clear, it's safe, you can go home. Um, the poems in Tangle, Tangle Line are kind of funky and a um, little different from that. And uh, they sometimes use a weird model in them of describe something to something else. And um, uh, Susan's recent column about the Washington Book Awards made me think of this one and uh, some of the energies that, that um, you know, can, can, can creep into um, discussions about prizes and stuff. And, you know, it's just a, it's a, fa a fascinating dynamic. You know, I, I noticed that um, almost all the fiction pri uh, finalists are from the from Spokane, and and in my opinion, well, I won't give my I can't, I'm not I'm not allowed to give my opinion about anything. Um, I, I learned that really early on um, uh, when I tried to share the governor's poem, but um, so I have no opinion. But this is um, describe book book blurbs to nationalism. You are necessary. You are the new you. You combine art and electricity, ham and rye. You are the sharp mustard between meat and cheese. Mm -hmm. You cling like burdock, flow like river. You are to your like we to wet. The house build, you house builder, you state builder, you democracy builder extreme. You hang sheetrock with neat seams. You paint the scenery so it seems real. You plumb, you deep, deep, deep. You wire the stars, you roof the sky. You intelligent, brave, brilliant, honest, you risk taker extreme. Oh, risky, risky you. You move, you muse, you dazzle, you brilliant, brilliant, brilliant you. You genius, you incarnation, you epiphany, Virgin Mary in moldy bread. You Walt Whitman mixed with Martin Luther King. You Dickinson, Shakespeare, Dante's lost brother. You Rome, you Byzantium, you radio, you chat room, you tweet, you needed, you flag, you necessary. Oh, say can you. If, if anything is, uh, you know, I think that one of the best benefits is to, re you know, re rethink the dialogue that we're having about about prize winners and um, uh, such. Um, opened up some good discussion with that, so thanks, thanks for writing that. Um, okay, this is a newer poem um, called Grizzlies. As if a meadow has intention and a stream refuses to wander, but instead flows without a swerve, so that salty foam from melting snow and glaciers slow trickle gather at the only bend that holds a grassy patch, two brown cubs digging avalanche lilies. We watch. If love can be a willingness to kill, then our stillness when the mama rises and sniffs the air, catches our scent and huffs paws the ground, kicks up wood chips and bark and duff, and stares at where we crouch, must share a not so distant kinship. The bear settles back to earth, hustles her cubs of up an avalanche chute, the three of them moving quickly over boulders and bent trees, leaving us with the meadow, our held breath, which we release, and the stream moving forward Without, with neither love nor intention. This is another sort of Ars Poetica poem. 
I grew up um, in, in, in Kansas, and um, I'm incredibly blessed um, to be in a place now where I don't have to fish for catfish. Um, because I fished for catfish all the time growing up and put liver on treble hooks and um, you know it was just kind of a grotesque um, thing um, and now I of course get to participate in the, the beautiful art of fly fishing which um, I have friends that tell me that I'm, I'm just as brutal and I just kid myself about catch and release and whatnot but at least I can pretend. Um, Ars Poetica. Some say fasten a sea clamp to stretch catfish pliers or vice grips to pull gray-black skin from the meat. We've always been a make-do-with-what-you-got sort, so a cinder block on the tail, peeled flesh imprinted with tracings of bones beneath. Long after they're dead, slit mouth heads will swivel eyes, gulp nothing through wiry lips. Some say fish can't speak, but of course they can. Best to give permission for just a few words, maybe six. One being water, one hunger, one rhyming with mud, and all the others part of a song known to bullfrogs and minnows, blood tune of leech and mosquito, hymn that swarming gnats hung, hum among swaying cattails, news, music for gut humid air. Reach in a pail for a nightcrawler to curl and pierce on a treble hook. But before you hurl the cast, notice the abandonment of the worm's dance. Now, one beautiful thing that I get um, traveling around is I get little gifts like this bookmark um, from Cheyenne and um, this poem. Um, from, um, uh, and I asked her if I could share it, but I, I, I don't feel comfortable um, uh, uh, giving her name. But uh, this is a student from Okanagan. And she wrote, as the lonely wolf howls, it wakens. As the bra brave wolf growls, it means it's time to run. As the scared wolf whimpers, it makes me feel safe. As the hunted wolf dies and is eaten and then runs away. As the lonely wolf howls once more, I know it's time to sleep. As the pack hunts together, I only have a little more time. And she wrote a footnote on the side for me. Um, this poem is told by a deer, yet written by me. <laughs> Love that. Lightning, the only intelligence rain gave. That first burst, a scintillating flash of self knowledge. We saw our bodies, pale starfish feet dragged from the sea, our sexes like swollen fruit left too long on the vine, bellies thick witnesses to slips in propriety. Chess two expansive maps of the wide dry plains, and our oh so lovely hands catching rain in cups we must drink from to deny the judgment of common sunshine, the rationality that evaporates in impulse, a sudden touch, the pounding rain. Laura Reed is a wonderful poet in Spokane, and she she read uh, she led a cool workshop where. Uh, each of us were supposed to pick an element from the periodic table and write a poem that somehow connected to it. Um, and this is my poem that came out of that. Um, it'll probably date me more than anything else, but so be it. Try not to sing along. <laughs> you shouted cruelties, and we left the house to walk around the park and get fresh air, leaving broken syllables, worried neighbors. The street fair and a warm sun brought out crowds for aggressive vendors. Pretend carnies, you'd snidely whispered when we first walked here. Today the world was bright but partially gone. Cracked glass, words had shattered and made clear. I was silent, my best way of being brutal. And we walked by a man whooshing helium by twisting a valve. Ninety-nine red balloons, I hummed. <laughs> and you glared and said, Luft, air, UFOs, a song of war not play, but it's stuck in my head for the rest of the day. This is wandering, no clouds. My boyfriend says that he likes the work of Jim Dine, but I once saw Pinocchio drinking from a paper cup and knew that he and I were both unsure about what it meant to be a boy, what it means to sing about a host of golden penises swaying and dancing in the breeze 
tossing their heads in sprightly dance toward the shining sun. I too am a sun, brighter than that distant star. My yellow light is a black-eyed Susan against the greed field of day. See the bright petals? They are the poems I would pluck to give to Jim Dine if he would walk with my boyfriend and me down the streets of Brooklyn, three men hand in hand in seersucker suits or dine in casual pants if that suited him. But poems like to get gussied up, to feel prettier than pants, to go outside and breathe in as much of the world as possible, because air is better that way, even if there is the risk of smog from the factories down by the bay. There is always the risk of something. And yet I say, if you're going to run with scissors, then you might as well tie your <laughs> shoes together and sprint. The black center of the flower is, of course, the sadness we carry. But Mr. Jim Dine, hear this. You become a real boy when you lie. And the eyes of Pinocchio need not be black. They can be blue or green or even purple. They can be never-ending daffodils or even golden pricks, just so long as that puppet sings along with me late at night, the karaoke machine playing, you supply the tune. After, he'll put me in his pocket like a poem and say we are toys and flowers. We are the continuous heavens over the world. We are friends. And I supplied the tune, of course, so you can have 99 red balloons uh, going around in your head. So, and I, I kind of was thinking about that, that poem and reading that poem because I'm wearing my um, Bro Brooklyn um, Poets shirt tonight with my, my favorite, well, probably my second favorite um, Brooklyn poet, um, Hart Crane, uh, is um, on the back here. Um, uh, and uh, Whitman's probably number one, but um, uh, for some reason that poem conjures Hart Crane and his, uh, his tragic um, uh, life. So. Okay, I thought I might um, read just a couple short poems from Bugle and then maybe finish with a longer poem from Darcy. Um, there, are, there are a lot of short poems toward the end of Bugle. It's kind of a brutal um, uh, book in some ways, but it, it ends with some gestures toward, um, toward quietness, perhaps, that are supposed to be um, some sort of solace, I suppose. No accident. We sit on suitcases by the side of the highway. Someone's coming to pick us up. Hungry and cold, we fiddle with latches on luggage. Darkness, the moon long ago fed to the shredder. Folding sleeves as if to position them for something, we unpack and repack our clothes. Meadow, walk slowly, lie down and wait for a quiet Black like the inside of a rock, one of those round stones, a glacier left among tiny flowers that you come upon just off the trail and say to yourself, how did this get here? Marvel for a moment as you learn to live in a field without a fence, gawking at blossoms. And of course, if you just can't get enough of that poem, it's on the back of bookmarks over here, which I'd urge you to take. They're supplied by Humanities Washington and Arts Wa, the two generous sponsors of the Poet Laureate position. Um, and the, um, besides um, sponsoring the position, uh, they, they um, of course, asked me to propose a project um, as Poet Laureate. Um, so in addition to bouncing here and there um, like some kind of meth freak um, <laughs> a, a, a electron become unmoored, um, uh, I, I am gathering poems from throughout our state. And so over here you'll see the call for submission for the anthology that I'm putting together called Washington 129. It'll include 129 poems from Washington. That's the number of years that Washington has been a state backing up from 2018 uh, when I finished the position. The deadline for submissions is January of, uh, of 2017, so it's coming up pretty, no, it's still ways away, <laughs> uh, still a long ways away. Um, but pl um, please consider grabbing a flyer um, and submitting um, up to three poems. All the directions are on it. You can also find the directions on um, my website, um, uh, and the address for the website's over there, there too. Okay, that was a commercial, um, so <laughs> commercial break. We'll finish with a couple of older poems um, from, um, dare say. Um, this is part of a long poem, and I'm just going to read a couple of short sections from it. Um, it's called After Kandinsky. Kandinsky is one of my favorite painters, and I, had, I was really lucky to get his lyrical painting on the front cover of, of the dare say book. Um, uh, just a beautiful painting that I, I love because of its, uh, uh, it looks to me like a cave painting, and um, um, that just struck me. After Kandinsky, Prome. 
what must be written. And I've got the idea from a poem from Hart Crane, actually, for the opening of his poem to Brooklyn Bridge. Um, he calls Prome to Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and it's kind of this invocation of everything that's going to happen in the poem afterwards. And um, it, it, it begins beautifully. Uh, I, I never, um, I didn't understand much of Hart Crane when I was first reading him. I just got intoxicated um, by the sounds. Um, how many dawns chill from his rippling rests, the seagull's wings will dip and pivot him, shedding white rings of tumult, building high over the chained bay waters, liberty. Then within violet curve forsake our eyes as apparitional as sails that cross some page of figures to be filed away till elevators drop us from our day. And it goes on from there. It's just this beautiful invocation, uh, invocation of uh, the magic of the Brooklyn Bridge. After Kandinsky, of course, now my, my poem's going to be garbage next to that one. So it goes. <laughs> After Kandinsky, Prom, What Must Be Written, is a poem of Kandinsky's spears, of particular things sharp and changing, of faith in the place of places, a poem in which the heart may rest, find solace in the kindness of balding men and the lyrical hands of mothers, a colorful poem with a subtle use of heavenly blue, a delicate shading of earthly yellow, a poem full of connections to everyday rituals like coffee, stroking the arch of a cat's back, like syntax, a poem that fixes the body to a specific place of points and lines and planes and yet moves to celestial music, a poem that tests one 15th century truth, whoever loves much does much, a poem that glistens with an unmatched insistence, a poem that arrives on time and demands everyone nail it to the wall. And thank you again um, for listening, and um, thanks for this, keeping this great series going, and holy smokes. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing as you travel around the state, you encounter all of these wonderful little pockets of art and community, and it's, it just uh, keeps me going, keeps me full of energy. It's, it's, just, it's just wonderful. So this is the last section of um, the longer poem to Kandinsky. So. Mimesis is a shot at God. Abstraction, a shot at the world. Neither can hold movement or the blooming flower, although da Vinci's drawings of musculature, extension, and rotation, or the study by Moybridge of the galloping horse, every tendon, each muscle flexing and stretching, bunching like cords of braided sun, just beneath the skin, come close. Almost as close as the explosions of color Kandinsky stitched together called black lines, stem-like sketches flecked all over the canvas we might think of as broken forms. We breathe, and breathing mimics the muscular movement of God for a while, and then creatures of dust and a spark we do what God can never do, that is, let loose an ecstatic flutter of lungs and stop. Dead Thomas Akempis, they say he turned away from light. Toward is the truth. Let us bury our saints and leave them to rot. Let us love the beautiful idea of worms. Then every juncture of tendon and bone, the great bag of skin susceptible to piercing spears, connect to an axis, axis spindle, the infinite arms of a star, and this spindle does what spindles do, it spins and hurls radiant blue dust across the heavens, a scintillating web that catches and eventually devours us in an end that is colorful and always exceeds the fallible eye. Thank you. So tonight we're honored to have Lisa Herbolt, Seattle City Council Member for District 1. That's us. We're District 1. I'm happy for District 1. <laughs> A few things you might not know about Council Member Herbolt is she majored in journalism at Syracuse University, which might or might not mean she's originally an East Coaster, but definitely means she loves words. While in Syracuse, she actually worked for an organization called SUN, S-U-N, Syracuse United Neighbors. Here in Seattle, Lisa Herbal has worked on issues of access, fairness, 
a commitment to shared quality of life. She's helped craft and pass public policy that includes paid sick leave for the 19,000 Seattle workers who didn't have it. <laughs> a rental house inspection program for renters' households and a claim criminal justice diversion program. I could keep going on, mm -hmm. but um, I'll just say that one of the things that was really exciting when I um, learned about Lisa Herbolt was I had never, and I voted for her, was I had no idea that I'd ever be voting for a council member who has a nose ring, so. <laughs> Please sign us. It's definitely um, a factor that cut both ways. I, I had several people at the door, so I did a lot of door knocking during my campaign who were, told me to my face, I had a woman who came, ran up after me down the sidewalk and said she would never vote. She didn't care what I, what my, what my issues were, but she would never vote for somebody who had a nose ring. So, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you know that there's a nose ring vote out there. <laughs> so, um, when I uh, uh, was thinking about what my poem was, it came to me very quickly and easily. Um, Unfortunately, and this is really antithetical, I think, to, to poetry, um, I didn't read the instructions until my way over here, and I'd forgotten that I was coming to CNP to do this. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to make my poem a little bit more family friendly <laughs> than it is in its original uh, version. So it, it's, again, a little antithetical to censor poetry, but I, I think it'll still work, all right? Whatever you want to <laughs> all do. Right. Um, so the, the poem is, it's a, it's a short one, but it's one that's near and dear to my heart. This Be the Verse by Philip Larkin. They screw you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the, thought, the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But they were screwed up in their turn by fools in old style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. <laughs> So I was raised with that poem <laughs> in its original form. And, um, but it made me feel really comfortable with the state of human existence, uh, as, as opposed to you know, being frustrated with my parents or being too worried about them being mad at me. It just made, normalized um, that condition and uh, was very comforting to me as a child growing up. Uh, and it's, my daughter wasn't a, um, I have an adult daughter now. She's not a poetry lover, lover but I sort of imparted that, that same philosophy onto her as I raised her. It's like, you know, don't worry about it. Another thing, my, my, my dad used to always say to, you, say to me, um, you know, this is the, the, I want to pass on to you the herbal curse that you, your children are as bad as you are. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of made everything okay. Part of, part, of, part of growing up, part of being a parent, part of, part of the human existence. Uh, right, you know, right down to the uh, get out as early as you can. You know, as, a, as a kid, like thinking about uh, you know, I, things like death. Um, it just made it all a little fun. And the, things, the, the meter of the, of the poem reminded me of um, you know, like a, uh, a Dr. Seuss poem or Shel Silverstein. Mm -hmm. It just um, made complex uh, and difficult emotions easy. <laughs> so I'm going to read uh, just a, a couple of poems of nostalgia um, from a manuscript I'm working on. Um, and these are sort of for Susan, my lovely friend. These are poems I know she likes. So. <laughs> Um, this first one, uh, if you are a person of a certain age, you may remember a kind of woman that seems to have disappeared, they no longer exist, um, called Maiden Ladies. The 
This is called Maiden Ladies. They were plentiful once, black hatted in museums of natural history, staring into yellow dioramas of basilisks, swaying so as not to be confused for the displays. They paid their dimes on rainy afternoons to sit with 10-year-old boys watching films about Brazilian snakes and Madagascan bats. Under their wraps, they wore beetle jewelry. They could be counted on to inform shop clerks of shameful declines in quality, to order special undergarments, extra plain, <laughs> unappetizing cuts of meat, and okra tablets to jam their feet into witch's shoes that made their ankles swell. Then hats went out of style. Shop clerks started talking back and the maiden ladies died. They're not even in museums. <laughs> and just as we are on the precipice of the fall equinox. Um, if I could have you sort of go back to summer solstice. Um, uh, this, is, this poem is called Lilacs and I was just thinking about when I wrote this about how the, the season of lilacs is so short that it kind of misses you sometimes and, and so um, that brings up other missing. Lilacs. As though we could string pearls into a necklace of only good moments between knots of wax string. Tonight, a month after the last lilac bloomed, I finally noticed, and no hothouse could make the bushes flower again late, early, whatever you call the period after you've lost everything. Still, cells replicate Shed skin is replaced. We are not who we were. I'd seen the lilacs, gone through the motions of breathing in, swirled the scent in the goblet of my brain, but I wasn't listening until this evening, after the first warm day in June, when I considered how fine a bunch of lilacs would be, enough to fill my arms, to hide my face in their tender, sweet nostalgia for ordinary life. And congratulations on the new Words West Reading Library. Thanks to all of you guys. Well, listening to all of these beautiful poets and poems, I've been thinking about Elizabeth Bishop's uh, metaphor, who said that prose writers are sort of taxiing along the runway, and the poets are the ones that take to the skies. So, alas, this is the runway portion of the evening. <laughs> And uh, I am excited, though, because this is the first time I'm reading publicly uh, from the manuscript for my new book, which will be published in April. It's called Mozart's Starling. Um, and he did have a pet starling. But I'm not going to talk about Mozart or his starling tonight. I'm going to talk about another starling happening that is going on at this very moment in seasonal time. Years ago, I heard the late Zen Buddhist teacher Robert Aitken give a reading at Elliott Bay. After, those who had gathered for the talk walked out the doors into a warm, late summer evening. Aitken Roshi had ended with a short meditation. Our minds were hushed and open. It seemed sudden when someone pointed and called out, look at the birds. There in the urban sky was a cloud of starlings, thousands of starlings, swirling in one of their great mesmerizing orbs. It's a sign, someone whispered. <laughs> and it was a sign. Autumn was coming. In the spring and summer, starlings divide on territories into couples and then family groups in the business of mating and nesting. But in the late summer, this exclusivity breaks down and starlings begin to gather into the groups that will grow into their huge fall and winter flocks. And so there's a lot of biological advantages to that. But starlings seem to take the evolutionary mechanism of flocking into the realm of high art when they gather in hundreds, thousands, sometimes even a million birds, and turn about the sky in 
Okay, I am deleting one of these adjectives right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. <laughs> Let me tell you what it is. Um, this is cross up mysterious. Graceful, spellbinding, dance clouds. Yes, there was more. Called. Um, do you know what they're called? Murmurations. Murmurations. I know, so beautiful. Um, so these are evasive maneuvers, complicated enough to beguile even a peregrine falcon, the most formidable of aerial predators, but they bewitch the human mind as well. As we watch them converge into great spheres, then swirl into funnels and ellipses, starling murmurations lift us into an elated, almost hypnotic state. Some ornithologists claim that starling flocks were originally called murmurations because of the varied songs that starlings are able to create. But starlings do not call out much during their flock dances, and I am more inclined to agree with other avian etymologists, there's such a thing, um, <laughs> who believe that the name comes from the whisper of wings, so many wings together in flight. Beneath a murmuration, I feel that I am kneeling in an ancient cathedral that ought to be silent, but instead whispers overhead with the gathered prayers of hundreds of years of pilgrims. But here is a much greater cathedral the entire sky, and the prayers are the light brushings of feathers. So for decades and centuries even, people have been trying to figure out how they manage to, sometimes these murmurations are a thousand feet long, right? And the birds at one end turn in just a fraction of a second, um, you know, a timing from the birds at the other end. And finally, our computer modeling and video slow motion it has been sophisticated enough to place on top of one another and we can figure out what's going on and it turns out there's lots of crazy things going on. Um, but one of them is astrophysics and morphic resonance. Um, one of them is this. These seven birds, um, it turns out the change in the movement of one bird will affect the seven birds closest to it. So those seven birds will affect the seven birds closest to them and these movements ripple scaling rapidly through the flock. How it happens so incredibly fast is still a mystery, but it's postulated that these moments of transition in starling movements mirror universal principles at work in the proteins and neurons that underlie, that underlie the makeup and movement of all creatures. Wow. Thus, starling murmurations may be the most visible and also the most winsome iteration of biophysical criticality. A mirror, <laughs> the poet would say it much better. Um, a mirror into deeper, unseen, all embracing secrets of life that have yet to be understood. Watching them, I feel that mystery viscerally. I feel my head swirl and my body sway. I always thought this was because the movements of mur murmurations are so graceful, and surely this is part of it but it may also arise from an unconscious identification with the same movements at work within the neurons of my own brain, deep calling unto deep, as the psalmist sang. I'm just gonna read one more little bit because I think it speaks to what we're doing here tonight. It's from this beautiful, feral place that we are able to respond to the breath of inspiration that summons us to the fullness of our creativity. Full, because we are cognizant that we are not a lone pair of hands or eyes or a single voice, that we do not create in isolation, but bring our gift, the art of our lives, to, another, to one another, to the earth. We touch the seven starlings closest to us in our own murmuration, and the ripple spreads, spreads faster than we could have imagined. We create from the song, just beneath our typical hearing, the murmuration that calls the tiniest neurons of our brains into flight. And thank you so much for having me again. This is a gem of a reading series for us in West Seattle and the city at large. So thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. And even though I am so excited that my chapbook just came out, I chose not to read from it tonight. <laughs> and I'm going to read just one poem from another publication that came out this September. This is a magazine called Dialogo. And it's, uh, um, it's more of an academic journal, but it deals a lot with Latino issues uh, throughout our, the US. And this actually, this issue is dedicated to migrant workers. And one of my poems appears in it, and I just thought the historical moment perhaps called for a little, um, 
a little moment of thinking about the issues that the poem raises. And the poem is about food, is about El Salvador's national food, which is called pupusas. Some of you may be familiar with pupusas. They are quite delicious, small, round, uh, Imagine thick tortillas stuffed with very yummy fillings. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been making this for, as nobody, nobody could really trace back how far Salvadorans have been making. This is a corn-based food. Um, and in a, here in the US and throughout the world, anywhere there are Salvadorans, there's pupusa restaurants. Mm -hmm. But, and I have been tracking the emergence of pupusa uh, as part of our vernacular in our culinary vernacular for a long time. So anytime I see an article about them, I collect it. So, you know, the New York Times had an article. Uh, Mark Bittman actually had an article, How to Make Pupusas. The PCC <laughs> had a class on pupusa making. And every time I see that, I, I remark on it because it means that there's a shift um, in Salvadoran immigration to the US, which is now about 30 years. Salvadorans have become the fourth largest group of Latino immigrants in the US. Um, so this is perhaps our most visible contribution to our society. And this is, I was reading the New York Times, the travel section one morning. And in the travel section was a weekend to Boston. And it said, you know, this is what to do to do if you go on a shoestring to Boston. And it had four little photographs. And one of them was Paul Revere's statue in the North End, which is an iconic statue. If you've ever been to Boston, this is Paul Revere, you know, in his midnight call. Uh, and if you've ever been to Boston, you have to go to the North End and see it. And actually, I, I, I think it's fabulous. But right below that, there was a plate with two pupusas. <laughs> and I could not believe it. This is Sunday morning, and I think, oh my god, we are now, this is a, being, is this a suggestion? If you go to Boston, these are the things you do. You go to this museum, this, and then you have pupusas at this place. And so then I sat down and I wrote this poem. <laughs> Just some context around it. Um, and then the other thing that you will hear is the word comal, which is the traditional implement that we use to make pupusas, which is a very a round, flat uh, griddle made of clay. And it's called comal. And you will hear the word um, as I read through it. So this is 13 ways of looking at a pupusa. And it is, um, of course, inspired by Wallace Stevens' poem, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. One, among the photographs in the Sunday paper of a weekend in Boston, the one right below Paul Revere's statue, the one of a white plate with two pupusas. Two, I am certain birds fly and pupusas breathe pleasure. <laughs> Three, once in Coatepeque, I saw a woman on a quiet street corner setting up a pupusa stall. A car went by. Dust from the unpaved road gained height, whirled. It was December. Along a whitewashed adobe wall, tall poinsettias burst scarlet and rich in the late evening sun. Four, my aunt makes pupusas for a living. She labors over a hot comal, gun shrapnel from the Civil War years encrusted in the flesh of her strong legs. Five. Tarde o temprano, sooner or later, speak of Salvadorans, speak of pupusas. <laughs> Six, can anyone deny the US funding of the Salvadoran military during the Civil War? Seven, thousands <laughs> fled toward peace, toward, toward places where war, sorry, let me read that again. Seven, thousands fled toward peace, to places where the war reached only in their heads. Eight. Pupusas are, pupusas have within their curved boundary a resistance recipe. Nine, oh thick-headed members of Congress debating immigration reform, don't you see the various conquerings at your feet? Pupusas among them, winning stomachs everywhere, <laughs> even named seductive Salvadorans in a newspaper culinary review. Ten. I know of divided allegiances to country, to language, to history. Then I also know stories need to be told. 11, 
the red star sprinkled banner unfurls and pupusa signs sprouting everywhere. 12. Women birth pupusas between the palms of wet hands, the maker's lifelines, the maker's lifelines imprinting the masa, her story a thousand times told. 13. We eat war. Each time a pupusa is made, war sloughs off undetected and unmeasured residues, unstable atoms, half-lives. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh my god, last reader, no pressure. Oh. <laughs> it's so lovely to be back. I think of this as my Seattle family. I feel deeply uncool living in the suburbs. <laughs> so awful. And so I pretended to be a West Seattleite last year. And I'm doing that again now. <laughs> um, I have two poems to share with you tonight. The first one is, um, requires just a little bit of information. The most popular living uh, singer in the Arab world is a woman from Lebanon named Fairuz. And if you were to go to most Arab countries in the morning and turn on the radio, there would be Fairuz music playing on the radio. She has a very distinct, beautiful voice, and she's been singing for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. So her songs are embedded in our childhoods and our history. Um, and this poem is from a manuscript that I've just completed, and it's entitled, Miss Sahar Listens to Fairuz in the Afternoon. I gathered the letters of your name the day they came for you. It is not our custom to cry when what is needed is fortitude. The day they came for you, I strung my tears like pearls on silk thread. When what is needed is fortitude, I worried the letters of your name like prayer beads. I strung my tears like pearls on silk thread to withstand your absence, the weight of days. I worried the letters of your name like prayer beads clasp them on my wrists like shackles to withstand your absence, the weight of days. You scattered the letters of my name and I clasped yours on my wrist like shackles, embrace of cold silver, bracelet of light. You scattered the letters of my name and I etched the letters of yours into the olive, embrace of cold silver, bracelet of light. I slid them like globes of sap beneath its bark. I etched the letters of your name, silent knife edge prayer, alphabet incantation. I slid them like globes of sap beneath its bark to nourish you with the pulse of our waiting. Silent knife edge prayer, alphabet incantation. When, rain course, when rains course over the wounds of this story to nourish you with the pulse of our waiting, your name will burn in night lanterns. When rains course over the wounds of this story, your name will shelter beneath olive leaves. Your name will burn in night lanterns as our story joins the others at the border. Your name will shelter beneath olive leaves. It is not our custom to cry. As our story joins the others at the border, I gather the letters of your name. This last poem is a poem of the moment, and I debated whether I should read this or not, and I thought, you know what, we're just going to do this. Um, in my house, we are multilingual, Arabic, English, French. My kid is a superstar student of Mandarin. I have no idea how or why. Um, the others are studying Spanish, and so language is always sloshing around, and we hear things sort of in stereo in a lot of ways. Um, and I think language and poetry are disciplines of attention. And so this is a poem that takes its title from the meaning for the prefix <coughs> con, C-O-N, together with thoroughly a deception. Con, noun, exception. Conned, verb. I don't see race. Conduct, noun, black body, brown body, veiled body. Conducive, adjective, phobic. Conflate, verb, other. Conflagration, noun. Mosque of Pulse nightclub bomber burned down by arsonist. Concept, noun. Nation, conceptual, 
adjective, united, connote, verb. At this time, it does not appear to be a terrorist act. Connotation, noun, no brown suspects. Condition, noun, truths held self-evident. Conditional, adjective. If they would just condition, verb, condemn terrorism, pledge allegiance, put their hands up. Concision, noun, brutality. Concise, adjective. Terence Crutcher can't stand for the national anthem, so neither can I. Contention, noun, in order to form a more perfect union. Contentious, adjective, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. Concern, noun, privilege. Concerted, adjective, City officials called for peace in the wake of the shooting incident, which was still under investigation. Context, noun, history. Contextualize, verb, and trail of tears, and slavery, and Jim Crow, and Minidoka, and Guantanamo, and contextual, adjective, and no Dakota Access Pipeline, and Black Lives Matter, and end the war, and end the war, and end the war, and Convention, noun, for all. Convene, verb, take a knee.